So today I'm going to be talking about dual energy CT or spectral CT. I think it is a new frontier for CT imaging. Usually we're very accustomed to black and white images, but definitely we're seeing the world through a spectrum of colors. This is my disclosure of commercial interest slide. We have a master research agreement with Siemens Healthcare. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Vancouver General Hospital. I'm sure most of you know uh, Vancouver General Hospital is a level one uh, trauma center. It's the only level one accredited trauma center in British Columbia. And uh, we're both a center of neurosurgical excellence, cardiovascular excellence. We're the burns unit for British Columbia. We're the transplant unit for British Columbia. We're also an oncological center. And we're also a, a cardiovascular center of excellence as well. And we do have an active stroke center as well and uh, um, we have a very uh, busy stroke practice. Now we started our emergency trauma radiology program in 2002 and we do have a dedicated fellowship program and it's been a huge success for our institution and the promotion of both of education and innovation and research. A lot of the research that comes from Vancouver General Hospital and is presented to RSNA does develop from the uh, ED department and the acute setting. One thing I would say our success though is based on the great collaboration and relationships that we have both with trauma surgery, emergency medicine, neurology, cardiology, and the ICU and the critical care physicians. They really do value the service we provide on a 24 hours, uh, seven, day, seven days a week uh, service. We have an on-site staff person, 24 hours a day, an on-site fellow, and an on-site resident as well. And this is a little video clip of the actual reporting area uh, that we have at Vancouver General Hospital. Uh, we have numerous fellows, numerous residents. We have big screens that uh, actually communicate with both the MRI unit live, the CT unit live, the ultrasound unit live as well. So we get real-time imaging of all our cross-sectional imaging modalities that happen in the acute setting. What we do have, and you can actually see at this in this particular slide, this is where the trauma bay exists. Our CT scanner was placed strategically next to the trauma bay, and that's had a significant impact. I would say probably the biggest impact on the emergency trauma radiology program was getting a dual source CT scanner that revolutionized our practice in the acute setting at Vancouver General Hospital. What I would say also, collaboration is key to the success for our program. Uh, we have numerous collaborative rounds. One of the most successful ones is the acute surgical emergency radiology and trauma rounds, coined ACID rounds by Dr. Luck Louie, who started these particular rounds. And every Friday we have intraoperative uh, pathological correlation with most of the interesting cases that present in the acute setting. Every Friday, about four to five cases are presented with interpathological correlation, and that's helped educate us and uh, teach us as well some of the mistakes that we commonly make uh, in the setting uh, of emergency and trauma medicine. One thing I would say, we're very fortunate as well, we do have an IT section. We had a gentleman, uh, one of our staff radiologists, which was, uh, he was a genius in IT, and he helped develop and write a lot of code and a lot of programs. And he developed these big boards uh, that actually give us real time um, analysis, analytics of what is happening to the emergency patients, both from a CT scan perspective, uh, uh, X-ray perspective, ultrasound and MRI. And you can actually see some of these studies are on red. You can see them in red. The ones that are finalized, those have final reports that have gone out to the clinicians. And that, uh, board is actually also in the ICU and also in the ED department. So there's, you know, the ED physicians and ICU physicians as well can actually see exactly what's happening to the studies, the status of the studies, within review, the dictated, or have been finalized as well. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, how does it work with trainees? Are you reading it children with residents? Yes. And we read with fellows and residents at the same time. We're all sitting in the same room. So the, we have five pack stations in the acute setting, so the residents read at the same time. They send us a case, we call them over because we're sitting next to them, and we review the case right then they're live with the resident fellows. Yeah, it's a very short turnaround time. I think we have the shortest one in the acute setting. We also run, uh, the staff is also busy as well because we do have tele uh, radiology services in the acute setting. So, if you know a little bit about British Columbia, it has a lot of uh, northern and inter health uh, territories. So, we do read after 5 p.m. for northern health, we read for interior health, 
We also read for Women's Hospital and we also read for UBC Hospital. So we run it around four to five ED departments in the acute setting. So the residents have their own cases. Usually we tell the residents to be present for all strokes and traumas. We give them the right of first refusal and they participate uh, with the trauma team. Uh, one thing I would say, we have a trauma pager and a stroke pager. So when the traumas, before they come to VGH or the strokes uh, get activated, we get a page because we're part of the provincial trauma network and then we get activated at the same time so we know when a stroke is coming and when a trauma is coming as well and all of our residents have to go to the trauma bay and also go to the city console to do real-time reporting of this trauma and stroke cases as well so if it says finalized is it finalized it's gone it's it's, it's voiced by the, by the staff so any finalized report is actually done by the staff individual so that is a finalized voice dictated report that goes out uh, to the clinicians so one other thing that we do have uh, is that we do have real-time dose uh, tracking as well in the ED setting. And you can see it's all in green there. We try to keep most of our doses under 10 millisieverts. We have different types of doses for our P studies, abdominal studies, and polytrauma studies. The polytraumas will go above 10 millisieverts, and then, then you'll see uh, it'll come up in red. So that sort of gives you a little bit of a clue why that particular trauma scan or stroke scan or P-study or abdominal scan went above 10 millisieverts. So it's a very neat little tool as well because then it gives us an indication as what happened with our protocol, how many we actually did. We see the protocol here, CD stroke, how many phases we did. So it gives us a, a little bit of an insight as well, real-time monitoring as to what's happened to the, to the, to the dose and we, if we have to monitor those actual parameters. One other neat uh, thing that Tim actually developed at our institution. It actually developed a code that actually reads the database of the actual radiology information system and the hospital information system as well. So when an order is actually put in by a clerk or an ED physician, we can see that the order has been placed. We know exactly which CT scan room it's gonna be scanning. We know the requesting physician as well. We know what floor the patient is in as well. So we can actually then, from here, it actually gets protocol and also gives us a, a sort of a safety mechanism. If an exam has fallen through the cracks, then we'll know exactly why nobody's come to talk to us. If the exam has not been actually been, uh, scheduled for in one of the CT scan rooms, then we would know what's happening to these particular patients. Then we'll give a call either to the ICU or wherever the patient might be to find out exactly what is happening to the patient. So it's sort of a sort of a safety measure internally for us in the ED to have a look. The patients that have been scheduled and then when they've been actually been uh, booked and into which CT scan room they would actually be imaged. Uh, uh, regarding workflow. It's actually really helpful from a workflow perspective. It really prevents things falling through the cracks. So that's just a small little tidbit about our department. You can ask me any other questions. One thing I was telling the residents that we've instituted our institution and we're fortunate and lucky because we have residents and fellows that are on site with the staff, but we will never perform a single examination in the acute setting without a consultation from the, either the stroke neurologist cardiologist or the ED physicians. We just won't perform it. The techs have specific orders and they won't do an examination without a clinician calling us for that particular exam. And the, re and the reason why I was telling the resident, sorry, go ahead. Sir. So you mean they have to talk to you virtually? Yes, they, they have. To not to say no, no. It won't happen. They have, well, it, they have to talk to us because that's the rule that we put in place and we've got support from the hospital on that. And the reason for that is it's a safety measure for the actual patients is what we felt when we went to the meetings. And the reason for that is, I mean, we're very fortunate to have a dual source CT scan in the acute setting. So let's just say it's a pulmonary embolism examination or a young female that comes for appendicitis. In our, in our institution, any female under the age of 40 will get an MRI for appendicitis, will not get a CT scan. That's just what we have at our institution. So we have somebody that speaks to them, that does the initial consult with the ED physician, or the GI physician as well. Same thing for trauma, same thing for stroke, and the techs just won't do the exam. They'll get the recs and they'll just say, go talk to the radiologist. They just won't perform the examination. And we got that support from senior medical directors. Of course. So the history that you've obtained from the referring physician, how is that documented in the system? So, so it's actually, if we still have paper, so the, uh, 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 paper uh, requisitions always printed out. We have a printer in the ED. So one is printed out. So we, 
we have it. So when they come and talk to us, we'll write some of the extra clinical features that are present. And then to be honest, that's extremely helpful from a stroke uh, perspective. Uh, it really helps us with our interpretations, to be honest. So any other questions about that process? So uh, today's objectives, you know, I'll just go over dual energy or spectral CT or multi-energy CT. It goes by very different names. And I'll talk about what we do at our institution. I think it's good to be exposed to this. Uh, at our institution, all of our exams in the acute setting are done primarily with dual energy applications. And I'll show you why. Because uh, I think it's very helpful from our perspective. It increases our diagnostic confidence in interpreting these types of studies. I think it improves our workflow. It makes some quicker diagnosis for us, and it gives us that extra confidence before we discharge a patient. And, and today I'll talk about the liver VNC, about what material decomposition regarding certain applications of the abdomen and certain applications regarding the musculoskeletal system. I won't just do some, I'll do some other than acute cases to show the benefit of dual energy CT. And we'll go over monoenergetic imaging, what it means, and stone analysis as well towards the end. So I'm, I'm not a physics expert, so I'll give you just my two words on dual energy CT. Basically, dual energy CT, you utilize two energy levels. Uh, to, we expose the patients by exposing the body or the, uh, the, the composition of the human body to two, two different energy levels. This can help us identify substances, label substances, separate substances, add substances, and actually identify the different types of materials that we're dealing with within the human body. The basic principle of dual energy CT, as we know, the two methods of interaction of X-ray matter, the primary mode of interaction of X-ray matter with the human body is the photoelectric effect We're in the diagnostic range of energies that we utilize. And basically the photoelectric effect, the probability of the photoelectric effect increases as the atomic weight composition of a compound increases like calcium, iodine, uh, copper, iron but is also inversely proportional to the energy cubed. And we can see that the lower the energy we utilize, the greater the probability of this photoelectric effect taking place. So compounds like calcium, iodine, copper, as I said, really increase in attenuation as you go towards the low KV spectrum, where compounds that are of organic composition, like uric acid, fat, slightly increase in attenuation as you go towards the high energy uh, part of the KV spectrum, and they decrease in attenuation towards the low KV spectrum. It's a very basic concept, but that is the concept that dual energy CT is based on that helps us identify cholesterol stones, but it can also help us subtract calcium, can help us introduce iodine and subtract iodine from a particular image, and I'll show you examples how it does matter from a clinical perspective. One thing I would say is that we all scan with polychromatic beams, and polychromatic beams, energies do overlap. The more separation you have between two polychromatic beams, the better the dual energy interrogation would happen. So on the third generation dual source scanner, the best combination is a 70 and 150 kV combination, because that's the best separation you can have between these two polychromatic beams. Even in these two energy, at the extreme energy ranges between 70 and 150, they still overlap between these two spectra. That's why we still have difficulties with dual energy CT, but as the technology expands with photon counting detectors for CT scanners, this will improve, the spatial resolution will improve, and also the separation of these uh, energies will also improve with advancement in technology. In a very simple concept between calcium and iodine, while well, we can sub subtract iodine uh, very quickly or we can subtract bones or calcium, is because if we look at this example right here, we can see as we drop the KV to 80 in this particular example, the iodine attenuation jumps from 150 to 400 Hounsfield units. The calcium also increases in attenuation, but not to the same degree as iodine does. So in very simple, basic idea between these two, you can see the low energy spectrum, you'll see bright iodine, slightly bright bone, you'll see dark fat. And as you go to the high energy spectrum, the fat becomes slightly brighter or cholesterol or organic compounds such as uric acid, while iodine drops in attenuation as does calcium as well. It's a very simple concept. It's the simplest that I can define and explain to you and it works extremely well in the setting of dual energy applications. One thing I would say 
regarding these dual energy applications, what we do, what the, the basis of all these dual energy applications, when we subtract and introduce iodine, we can also quantify iodine, is the following principle, what we call material decomposition. And basically, in all dual energy, you have to define your base material. So let's, I'll give you an example. Let's say the liver V and C example. So let's say we're interrogating the liver. So the, three, the two basic compounds, your base materials in the liver, is actually fat and soft tissue, being water density. And then your third material is the material of interrogation that you'll introduce and subtract from the actual image. So we know the attenuation of fat and water based at the low and high KVP. You plot that out, creating your identity line, which is this red line right here. And then as you introduce iodine into an image, so you'll have fat and iodine, you'll have uh, water and iodine, we know exactly that increase attenuation is attributed to iodine itself. Then we know the differential attenuation of iodine both at the low and the high KV spectrum. It's an actual ratio. It ranges anywhere between two to four, depending on the voltage combination that you utilize. You apply this ratio into the equation, and then that subtracts the iodine and brings you back to your identity line, which is the red line. So you can introduce iodine, you can subtract iodine. We actually know in each voxel how much iodine is actually present because the attenuation is attributed to iodine. We can actually quantify the amount of iodine, not just measure Hounsfield units, but we can actually quantify the iodine in milligrams of iodine per cc. So we can actually quantify, subtract, and reduce iodine. This material decomposition algorithm can be applied to any algorithm as long as you define your base materials. So you could do, use this in the musculoskeletal applications. And uh, instead of iodine, it would be iron. And then you can do the same thing with iron where you can actually introduce iron, you can subtract and label and identify iron as well. So you could do that as well for iron, copper, silicon, whatever that material in question. The key thing about it though, it has to be able to move away from the identity line. The further it moves away from the identity line, the better you can add, subtract, and introduce a material. What, one thing I would say about monoenergetic imaging, the way the scanner that we utilize actually does that. As I said, we scan in polychromatic beams. So you have both an 80 and 140 KV, KV image, or you have a 70 and 150. You can extrapolate those polychromatic beams into single energies from 40 kilo electron volts all the way to 190. And there's some significance to monoenergetic imaging. And some of the significance of monoenergetic imaging, you can significantly increase the attenuation of iodine towards the low KV spectrum. So you can actually save examinations that you don't have good opacification within the pulmonary trunk. But what you can also do, because it's a single energy, it's not a polychromatic beam, it doesn't suffer from beam hardening. So you don't have the beam hardening effects that you have from a polychromatic beam. And that helps you interrogate like screws from a fixation in the actual spine. You can reduce these artifacts that occur from metallic implants as well with monogenic imaging as well. So, and also the monogenic imaging can also help you characterize gallstones and other types of materials as well because these types of materials behave differently under the low KV spectrum versus the high KV spectrum. So from a monoenergetic mono uh, interpretation, you can have all the way from 40 to 190. And you can see these images, 70 kilo electron volts is actually equivalent to a 120 kV image. And then you can go all the way down to 40. The noise goes up, definitely. You can use iterative reconstruction to decrease the amount of noise in the actual image. But definitely you can see, you can increase the conspicuity of actual lesions within the liver. It has significant implications from an oncological perspective, head and neck tumor imaging, which I have some examples, it can really be helpful with staging and also the detection of actual lesions where you don't, where, where they can, they're extremely small. You can definitely increase the conspicuity of these lesions within parenchyma, and it's very useful for oncological imaging. The other thing I would say about monoenergetic imaging, each one of these compounds has a unique spectral curve. And each one of these compounds behaves as you go towards the low KV spectrum. You can see iodine significantly increases in attenuation. I can tell you that fat, uric acid, cholesterol, behaves in a very different fashion. It doesn't increase towards the low KV spectrum, but however, you have a reverse spectral uh, pattern. And these are unique fingerprints 
and people are doing a lot of research that each tumor might have a very unique spectral curve in oncologic application. The malignancy of the tumor, how malignant it is, uh, degree of enhancement, it will behave very differently. And each one of these, there's a, new, a lot of research that is being explored into tumors that have very unique spectral curves. So the way it works from a, a workflow perspective, you have a mixed image, which you can create, and I'll show you some examples, which simulates a 120 kV image. You have your virtual non-contrast, where you can subtract the iodine from an image that simulates a, uh, a routine non-contrast image. You have iodine maps with different window and level, what we call the iodine overlay map, uh, or the iodine perfuse blood volume maps. And then you have your 45 kEV uh, a monoenergetic imaging as well. So in every dual energy interrogation, the latitude of imaging is tremendous. So it's not a matter of you know, what you can do, it's a matter of having the time to explore these types of images. I'm just curious, when you started out with your dual energy, did you go right away with the virtual non-contrast, or were you scanning in the contrast, and at what point did you decide the EMTs were reliable? Yeah, so I think when we started out initially, to be honest, when we started out, we started in the non-contrast applications. Uh, so we started with monoenergetic imaging, decreasing the artifact for metals in musculoskeletal. We started with bone marrow edema, because you don't have to use any contrast. And we started with gout, and then slowly we introduced it into the liver VNC, is what I would say to you. But what we did initially, we balanced the dose. So some of the initial work that we did was on the pancreas. So we actually always had a routine non-contrast CT that we did. I mean, it, maybe it was a little bit more dose, but we did ba you can actually balance your dose in your liver VNC, that your dose did not go too high. And then we would do non-contrast. We wouldn't do it at 120 kV. We'd do a non-contrast at 100 kV, let's say, to limit the dose. We use iterative reconstruction to drop the dose in our routine non-contrast examination. Then we have published some papers that we showed the liver VNC is reliable. There's definitely some instability in the Helmsful units between a routine non-contrast examination and a regular VNC examination. However, from a clinical perspective, the studies that have come out show n doesn't matter clinically at all. Yes, we, we do. We, to be honest, I, I'll show you some examples. We, we've bypassed for the abdomen. We're bypassing the non-contrast examination com uh, completely now because we've become comfortable with it. Um, the, it depends what your level of comfort is. I would say the abdominal division, they're still finding the feet with dual energy is what I would say. The neuroradiologists have taken to it, uh, and I'll show some examples why. I would say the musculoskeletal team is completely sold on it. So every single MSK examination at VGH is done dual energy. So I would say the abdominal and the chest division slowly are coming around is what I would say to you. But it's, uh, you're right, a lot of people don't trust the, the, the liver VNC. The one thing I would say about the, the literature that's presented out there and People call me and ask me, oh, geez, look at what the study showed. And then some bad studies have been published out there regarding uh, the liver VNC not having, being reliable compared to the regular uh, non-contrast. The problem is when you read those studies very carefully, though, uh, you have to read them very carefully, they've used completely different voltage combinations than what is supposed to simulate a 120 kV non-contrast examination. So you really have to speak to your physicist. So when you do these voltage combinations with dual energy, it would be 70 and 150 is completely different what you get compared to an 80 and 140 or a 90 and 150 examination. You can play around with that combination on, on a phantom model with your physicist to simulate exactly what your 120 kV would be from a Hounsville unit perspective. So these people that do publish, they're comparing apples and oranges. They're not comparing apples and apples, and that's a big concern from our own perspective because this instability of the Hounsville unit doesn't just exist between a liver VNC and a regular non-con exam. I can tell you when coronary calcium was going on, there was complete instability in the Hounsville unit measurements on our Toshiba scanner versus the GE scanner versus the Siemens scanner that nobody addressed, is what I would say to you. The other thing is a lot of people, some people pay attention to the KV, but some, I've seen people scan the machine because the machine picks automatically a 100 KV scan over a 120 KV scan. We have the software on the scanner that decides to do that. And a lot of people don't pay attention to the 100 KV that it scanned the abdomen in 100 KV. All of a sudden they're calling increased attenuation in these lesions all over the place, and yet they're comparing it to a 120 KV scan. And we know that KV causes significant instability in household unit measurements. Yes. 
No, you, you know you don't. Uh, yeah, it depends. What I would say to you, what I use duology, and what I say only if I have a question to answer. I do have it, and I'll show you uh, this software that you can decide yourself. And, and I have a slide, and I'll show you the slide. You, you can decide yourself which they have advanced. The biggest thing about duology was the workflow. It was a big issue for radiologists. We're all busy. We have a significant, uh, I mean, we're all busy. We're trying to get through the volumes. All of a sudden, now you have to look at these five different uh, sequences, is what I would say, no different than MR. So uh, it's automated, so you can choose. For, so on all of our abdominal examinations, we'll send over an iodine overlay map, and we'll send two monoenergetic. Uh, sequences. You don't have to do anything yourself. So that's done right at the scanner itself. So it'll send it over to the packs and it's there in the packs. Now, if you want to look at them yourself, you're more than inclined to do so, but at least they're sent to the packs for the people that do want to look at them is what I would say to you. Myself, I just click on the thin client because I'm comfortable with it because I like to do my own interrogation. But just from a workflow perspective, like even for musculoskeletal, we'll send the bone marrow edema stuff to the packs as well for the MSK guys. It's, if they look at it, it's great. If they don't, no one's going to find fault with them. I will show a case later on where there was a medical legal case where no one looked at the bone marrow edema, and this lady came back with a complete fracture that she needed an external stabilization device and transected her uh, popliteal artery. Because there was bone marrow edema, she should not be weight-bearing on it, but no one bothered to look at the bone marrow edema images. So it is something that people need to be aware of, that's why the abdominal division is a little bit hesitant to take it on because I don't blame them. If you're going to send them to PACS and you're going to look at them, you are also accountable for those images. So let me just move forward. So uh, we talked about that. So this is the, that auto protocol that I said. It's called FAST DE results. So you can actually auto tasking. It's done actually at the actual scanner. You don't have to do anything yourself. So you can decide which KEVs you can send to PACS, and also if you want to send iodine overlay maps, you can send your gout images to PACS, you don't have to do any interrogation yourself, you can send your bone marrow edema images as well to PACS as well. So in the end, it's up to you what your level of comfort is. Uh, in the ED, we're extremely comfortable. One thing I would say from, and we'll talk about bone marrow edema, but again, you know, you always have this identity line right here, and you can actually subtract calcium from an image as well. And then you can actually color code the bone marrow edema that is present when you subtract the calcium from the actual image. The attenuation within the bone marrow actually increases. It goes above the red marrow. So then you can color code it because that attenuation goes up. You can color code it with different color combinations and you can identify bone marrow edema as well, which has been one of our, uh, one of our most successful applications in the acute setting is what I would say. And the MSK individuals are completely bought into this. And I'll show some examples about gout as I was telling the residents, but some of our biggest success that we've had has been in the gout arena because the rheumatologists completely bought into this. And now we have numerous, and I'll show you an example why, we have numerous drug companies that are coming now to try to do research because they're very interested about the deposition of uric acid, not just in the musculoskeletal system, but in the coronary arteries, the aorta, the carotids, because it can induce significant cardiovascular inflammation. So the way this technique works, and I'll show it to you in real time. So this is a case that was done for a pulmonary embolism examination. So uh, this patient did not have pulmonary embolism, but there was some thickening around the descending thoracic aorta. You subtract the iodine, and you can see the intramural hematoma. Now, the image quality is not as good as a, a non-contrast. It can never be as good as a non-contrast examination. We need to understand that concept because a non-contrast has no overlap of the two KV spectra as dual energy imaging has. However, from a clinical perspective, you can make a diagnosis as an intramural hematoma, and this patient had a dissection, not an actual embolus. This is another case that came in chest radiograph, unremarkable. So this patient uh, had a um, query dissection, from what I remember correctly. I can see in this particular example, there is some thickening around the ascending aorta, and there also was a penetrating also as well. So I'm just going to play this video clip while we do. And then, so the iodine is color-coded in orange here. And as you can see, there was a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer right here. And what you could do, 
we can move at the bottom. You can actually introduce the iodine. You can subtract the iodine. There was thickening around the ascending aorta. And you don't have to do non-contrast imaging because, to be honest, what's the use of You can do a complete iodine overlay map, and then you can bring your slider to the left, and you can see there's a big intramural hematoma. Is it as good as a non-contrast? No. Does it matter clinically? No. Because the diagnosis is made, you know, this patient has an intramural hematoma. There is no reason to get a non-contrast oh. examination. You can actually measure the Hounsville units as well. You can see this is 87 Hounsville units on this virtual non-contrast. So from a clinical perspective, it does not matter. Clinically, we made the diagnosis. We did not need to do any uh, non-contrast examination. We do use it sometimes for vascular runoffs. I can tell you uh, some of these patients with severely calcified vessels, you can see it's very difficult. This patient has a stent that was placed here. And you can actually subtract stents. You can subtract calcium. You can see it's completely occluded. They did have a crossover graft. They were worried about evulsion of the crossover graft. This is a diabetic patient. It's, I tell you, reading a scan like this at 3 a.m. in the ED, you have a diabetic patient with full of calcium. One thing I'm just going to concentrate on is actually the trification. And we can actually see right here a lot of calcium. We subtract the calcium, and it has a complete occlusion. So initially, when people don't believe us, of course, that this thing actually works, they go on to a cath, and you can see on the cath as well that they definitely have occlusion of the distal popliteal artery just proximal to the trification. It can be very useful in people with heavy calcium, particularly diabetics, from a duology perspective. So you can subtract that. This particular patient, uh, pulmonary embolism, and we'll talk about a recent study just briefly that was published in radiology. I think the study missed the point why we do dual energy imaging from, from a pulmonary embolism, embolism perspective. This was actually not an easy patient. She had an invasive thymoma with uh, pleural mets, and she came with chest pain. So you know, what is the cause of her chest pain? Is it her metastases? Is it the, uh, is it the thymoma? And actually, when we looked at this examination, it was very difficult for me to detect the embolus uh, within the lateral segment of the uh, middle lobe. So what I say again about dual energy, it increases my diagnostic confidence if I'm actually missing an embolus or an embolus is pr present. This is a dual energy iodine map that actually shows a peripheral wedge-shaped perfusion defect. It's pathognomonic that you're dealing with the pulmonary embolism, and the embolus is there. I mean, we can play around uh, on the images uh, that the embolus is definitely present in this particular image. You can play with these iodine maps, uh, but definitely there's an embolus that goes right into the center of, these, of this perfusion defect. So from my own perspective, before I send a patient home, I just quickly have a look at these iodine maps, and there's definitely an embolus uh, in this particular segment. Uh, I just look at these iodine maps. If they're completely clean, I don't worry about it at all. I know that patient doesn't even have a small subsegmental embolus. Well, we also use the dual, uh, this is the actual same patient. This is the clot that is color coded in red in the center of this perfusion defect. What I would say as well, I think some of the power of dual energy CT is to follow up post treatment because these patients do come back with chest pain, and they say, oh my God, is it a PE that's causing the pain for this particular patient? Definitely they had an embolus with a clot right here, per peripheral perfusion defect. On the post-treatment and follow-up, when they came back to the ED, there was no more perfusion defect. This patient does not have a recurrent pulmonary embolism. The other thing I would say, and a lot of work was done by Joe Sheff at the Medical University of South Carolina. We all measure the right ventricle when we look at prognostication uh, for bad outcomes for pulmonary embolism. I'm not going to get to all of the studies, but what people have doing and still are doing is measuring the actual uh, perfusion defect as a volume of the total perfusion of the total lung that is being perfused. And what Joe Sheff uh, demonstrated at their institution, if you have a greater than 5% perfusion defect relative to the total lung perfusion, he showed that that was actually a stronger predictor of poorer outcomes for these patients that the right ventricle to left ventricular uh, ratio is what I would say. So dual energy, CT, and perfusion maps brings us back to the, the whole spectrum that the integrity of the microcirculation of the pulmonary parenchyma is actually important in the assessment of pulmonary embolism, which we always knew from nuclear medicine uh, perfusion uh, imaging. 
What I would say as well, sometimes, you know, in this particular study that was recently published in the Journal of Cardiovascular Computer Tomography, I mean, they showed that if you have significant perfusion deficits within your lung, these patients had higher, uh, had higher, sorry, higher mortality within six months. These are guys with no thromboembolic events. Either we missed them, my feeling is you probably scan the legs and you'll find a clot, as has been demonstrated in previous studies. And these are patients that have these perfusion defects and they had poorer outcomes than patients who did, who did not have any perfusion defects. Now, this is the recent paper that was published in radiology in 2018 that said, well, dual CT adds only incremental value to a regular scan. That could be a true statement, but they missed the point about what dual CT actually provides for you in the acute setting. It's not about seeing you uh, pulmonary embolism, in my opinion. It's increasing your own diagnostic confidence, streaming your workflow, speeding things up, in my own opinion. I look at the duology maps now, personally, before I even look at the PE study, and if I see no provision defects, I'm actually extremely comfortable myself in saying there's no PE at all and discharging that patient. So for me, the study missed the point. It's about increasing your diagnostic confidence and giving you that second look that you know I'm missing something in the acute setting. Regarding, and there's another recent paper that was published in radiology that compared delayed dual energy CT with more energetic imaging compared to my MRI, which is the gold standard for delayed imaging in the detection of scars. And they showed that dual energy CT with more energetic imaging performed extremely well compared to delayed enhanced MRI imaging. And some of the examples from this particular uh, uh, study, you can see this is an MR imaging that shows this delayed enhancement in the interventricular septum. You can actually see it on the monoenergetic imaging as well and on the iodine maps as well. And you can use color coding as well, which I think helps as well. So dual CT does have a benefit as well in the heart, and I'll show you an example as well, not only for delayed enhancement, but it also has a benefit for tumors like myxomas versus thrombi, and also slow flow versus clots within the left ventricle and the left atrial appendage. As I said at the beginning of the talk, we can also quantify the amount of iodine that is actually present within a particular compound or substance or pathology. And some studies that have been published that have shown that the mean iodine concentration was significantly different between a thrombus and slow flow thrombus being low, slow flow being much higher. So it's very, a very quick way to differentiate between thrombus and slow flow. It actually performs better than transesophageal echo in the study that they performed. Because slow flow gives you that spontaneous echo transmission, gives you that puff on a transesophageal echo. It can be very difficult to make sure that it is slow flow versus actual thrombus. In this particular example, and I'll show you, this was a dual energy that was done on this bypass graft individual. There was a couple of reasons why we did, did a dual energy, but any bypass graft uh, individual, we don't have to do a non-contrast. It can be very helpful in this particular patient, and I'll play the video clip. There's a high density uh, substance. We'll see it on, on a regular non-contrast right here. That was a contrast, was extravasation. We didn't know, but from a dual energy interpretation without doing a non-contrast examination. We know for a fact this is not iodine, this is surgical material. It was very different than a surgical clip and you'll see it. So from a, we can introduce, and I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna take the iodine out. We can see it's high density. It's not a clip. It's some surgical material that they left. And then I'm gonna introduce the iodine back into the image and we can see that it doesn't become bright at all. So it cannot be iodine. It's a very useful application. We can see there might have also been some ischemia in the myocardium in this particular patient, but it's a very useful way to differentiate high density material of what represents actually iodine. The monoenergetic imaging from a pulmonary embolism perspective can also be very helpful in my opinion, because remember, once you scan, you do have this monoenergetic capability as well. And what I would say to you from a study, if we actually look at this particular study right here, we can see that the Hounsfall attenuation at 40 kilo electron volts is 1,418 Hounsfield units. So 
people that sometimes say, oh, the study's not good, not good enough attenuation, you can just switch on the monoenergetic application and the attenuation of iodine goes through the roof. You can actually save a study. We've actually decreased our uh, contrast for our pulmonary embolism studies using 40 cc's of contrast on all of our dual energy PE studies. What I would say, Jonathan Leipzig, you know, published a study that they did this in people with compromised renal function, and he actually took his, his contrast down to 28 cc's versus 62 cc's in these people with compromised renal function. The other thing I would say about monogenic imaging, sometimes it might be able, it might help you uh, identify the areas of clot much, much better than a regular 100, even 100 kV examination. The other thing you need to understand, you can actually see there's probably a clot here, much better appreciated on the monoenergetic imaging. The other thing I would say about monoenergetic imaging, you can actually see the streaks here. So you can see the streaks from the actual contrast. Because it's single energies that I talked about at the beginning, it does not suffer from beam hardening effects as a polychromatic beam suffers. So monoenergetic imaging can be very helpful from that perspective as well. We'll move on to, and I'll move quickly, we'll go through these cases. I'm just gonna go into the utility, and there's a big utility from a post-thrombectomy uh, in uh, people with stroke. One thing I would say people with strokes, and people know, a common thing, and the residents know this, that they do neuroimaging, is that an iodine spill, is it a brand new hemorrhage post-thrombolysis? Dual energy CT was meant for this type of application, because we can actually see with a regular 120 kV scan, there's definitely high density in the basal ganglia, we can see on the iodine overlay map that it's iodine. We can see on the virtual non-contrast there is no iodine present at all. So this is iodine. This is not a hemorrhage. So it's very useful. We do it on all of our post-thrombolysis patients. Not a single patient that doesn't have dual energy imaging on post-thrombolysis. The second thing is it's very useful for if you're dealing with a tumor, are you dealing with a metastasis, are you dealing with a hemorrhage? We can see in this particular example, this was a routine five-minute enhanced delay examination. They're worried about a hemorrhage versus a mass. We can see this nodule of iodine enhancement in keeping, in this particular example, this patient was taken to the OR, it was a single lesion, this was a renal metastasis. One thing I would also say about uh, 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 stroke imaging, there's some new interest, and we published a paper in the Journal of Investigational Radiology based on this paper, and what they did, they compared the regular non-contrast examination to a virtual non-contrast by doing the subtraction technique. And what you can do with these subtraction techniques, you can actually modify your subtraction. And you guys all, it goes counterintuitive of what we were always taught in stroke imaging, that you want to always see great white matter, gray matter differentiation. However, you can actually use a subtraction algorithm where you can actually subtract the gray from the white matter, where you decrease this gray white matter differentiation but it brings out the cytotoxic edema from an actual stroke. It actually makes it more sensitive to cytotoxic edema. And I'll show you some examples. And these guys actually thought the virtual non-contrast, even in people with hemorrhage, was actually superior to a non-contrast examination. They could see the strokes much better. The strokes are actually bigger than what the regular examination would provide. I mean, there's hemorrhage involved. So this was the initial paper that was done. I'll just show you an example from our institution. Definitely in the experienced eye, there's something going on in this particular area of the cerebral hemisphere. However, to see an image like this, even, you know, anybody can say there's definitely something wrong in that particular hemisphere. Not only there's something wrong, but what we showed is it changed the aspect score uh, of these particular patients. So the stroke is actually much bigger than what your eye is seeing on the regular non-contrast examination, you go superior as well. You can see that it actually involves the basal ganglia as well, the head of the cardiate. So the stroke becomes more conspicuous. You take out this gray white matter differentiation by subtracting the gray from the white matter. It's an algorithm that's done. And then you actually make the exam sensitive to cytotoxic edema. One thing I would say, I just want to show this example from a head and neck. This is not the ED, but I just want to show people that are interested in oncological imaging. These people publishing uh, uh, in, in radiology about these different types of studies that can be very helpful for staging of uh, head and neck malignancies. In this particular example becomes very difficult to say that the tumor is actually invading the thyroid cartilage. If you do the iodine overlay map, you can see there's no orange in the thyroid cartilage, so there cannot be any invasion. This was proven 
on surgical specimens that were removed. Another example, this particular example, they thought there was invasion right here. On the iodine overlay map, there is no color coding orange over the cartilage itself. This was, there was no tumor present. So it can be very helpful in squamous tumors as well. Now, people that do a bit of spine imaging always know that we suffer from artifacts through the shoulders. So what you can do with dual energy imaging, you can actually use what they call tin filter imaging because there is a tin filter in the actual uh, tubes themselves that actually filter, pre-filter the beam itself. So what you can do with uh, tin filters, you can actually filter a 140 kV image or a 120 kV image and you make it into a pure x-ray beam. And the, the issue when you do it into a pure x-ray beam, instead of having these artifacts through the shoulders, you can actually now start to see the cervical cord itself. It really improves the visualization of that always difficult area that we always say there's too many artifacts, can properly interrogate the cervical thoracic junction. You can actually see the cervical thoracic junction nicely, clearly demonstrated with this tin filter imaging. So a very neat technique. Again, you can see a lot of artifact nicely demonstrated. From an, uh, uh, I showed this case to the residents today. So one thing I would say about dual energy imaging as well, it actually starts to give you a little bit of physiology. It starts to bridge the anatomy of the physiology. I did show the residents this case today. This is a case, there was a stabbing and there was bleeding. As we can see, there's bleeding from the right kidney. Initially, the radiologist who read this didn't think the bleeding was that bad. This is the arterial phase. This is the portal venous phase image. So they decided to just sit on the patient. The patient went back to the trauma bay. Then the patient started deteriorating and I was in the uh, ER room uh, with some of my colleagues. We switched on the dual energy application and I'll switch it on right here. And we can actually see from this kidney that it's not just bleeding. Small. There's major oozing of blood that's happening from that site of the laceration. So this patient's actively bleeding intensely uh, while the scan, you can actually see the, the, the hematoma as well, that's of high attenuation. So we communicated that to the surgeons, the patient was transferred to the angiographic suite and was successfully uh, embolized. You know, can it be helpful? Look at this particular example. This guy's a gunshot wound. They were about surgical material, they were about bullet fragments, and there was this area of high attenuation in the gallbladder fossa. So let's look at this example from a dual energy uh, application. High density on portal venous phase, high density on the iodine overlay map, nothing on the virtual non-contrast, nothing on the iodine, uh, nothing on uh, iodine on the iodine only black and white images. So virtual non-contrast, no iodine. Iodine overlay iodine, this has to be iodine. It's not surgical material, it's not a hematoma, this adine did a Doppler ultrasound that proved that there was a pseudoaneurysm. What about this particular case from a trauma perspective? This is a great case, and I'll show you why those rounds do matter when we get surgical pathological correlation. This was a case that Duanji definitely detected. This is a trauma case. So we'll look at this dual energy uh, portal venous phase. This patient had a significant injury. There was many other injuries going on. They had a, a, a splenic laceration. He was bleeding from the spleen as well, but there was another injury and I'll show you as I do the interrogation, I'm gonna subtract the iodine from the actual image itself right here. And then I see a bright spot, right anterior to the IVC and the aorta. And in that anatomic region, there's also soft tissue. You have to look at the routine portal venous phase. And in that anatomic location is where the mesenteric tear was present. And that's where we directed them. We said there's a mesenteric tear, there's an acute you know, sentinel clot, there's some soft tissue stranding from the actual bowel itself here. We were very concerned that this patient had a mesenteric tear. They went to the OR, and let me just show you the actual OR image. That's how we learned. This is the actual mesenteric tear right here that was present, proven pathologically in the OR. So dual energy CT can be very helpful from that perspective. <coughs> GI bleeding can be helpful is what I would say. We talked about, you know, you do triphasic imaging for GI bleeds, right? I, I strongly believe that, you know, just one phase with dual energy CT probably will give you the answer, in my own opinion. 
So let's just look at this particular example. This patient was bleeding. We'll have a look at this example. We'll concentrate on the second portion of the duodenum. So this is what your dual energy decomposer, this is done in 90 and 150 kV voltage combination. We'll look at this example. And as we go, we'll actually see there's some bright spots that are present in the second portion of the duodenum right there. So we always give water, of course. We never give oral contrast for our GI bleeds. So we click on the application now. We've gone to the iodine overlay map. And by the way, this is real time that I'm showing you that people say it takes a long time. It doesn't really take a long time. There's some areas of a little bit of high density in there uh, that are present, which indicates that there's some sentinel clot or some hematoma present as well. And then we can introduce the iodine, proving that it is iodine that is actually present in that particular area. You'll see as I move up and down, we'll see the iodine that is present quite intensely and in the lumen itself, confirming a D2 uh, hemorrhage. This particular case was a very complex case. This is a, a Ruin Y, and everybody looks at Ruin Y. This is a very complex case. It was dilatation of the biliopancreatic loop. And there was this area right here that was very worrisome and difficult to work out. There's three areas of high density in this particular picture. So if we look at the virtual non-contrast, when we subtract the iodine, we can see this bright density here, though that must be some acute hematoma, right? And then we can see on the iodine overlay maps where the hematoma is present, it's black, there's no iodine. We go forward where that third density is. There's two densities here. There's a third density. We can see the hematoma. We can see those two densities right here. They have not been subtracted from the image, so those are surgical material, and we can see the third density actually represents active contrast extravasation. There's a hematoma that was causing the blockage. Just going to move forward for time's sake about bowel ischemia. We can all, all of us can identify bowel ischemia, in my own opinion, even on a routine CT. In my opinion, again, dual energy is not to replace or that yeah, people can diagnose bowel ischemia on a CT examination. My, my thing about CT it just increases my diagnostic confidence when I call bowel ischemia, that I'm very certain. I tell the surgeons, I do the dual energy iodine maps. Our surgeons are starting to believe in these dual energy iodine maps now. All of our surgeons ask for dual energy, and they want the dual energy iodine maps, because you can see that it definitely proves when bowel ischemia really occurs. Even here in this particular example, you think there might be some slight attenuation. You can see this is very, not really high attenuation. That actually could be intramural hematoma. This particular case was a groundbreaking case for us because I di we diagnosed an ultrasound acute cause cystitis. The patient was not doing well at all. So we said, what do we do now in the ED? The patient was, had peritoneal irritation. They were just not doing well at all. So this was the CT that was done. We can see the goblet is taking a very transverse orientation as well. You s click on the dual energy iodine maps very quickly. You see there's no iodine uh, uptake at all in the gallbladder. This is actually a gallbladder volvulus. It's a very rare entity, but it's a true entity, and it does matter from an outcome perspective what you actually do with those particular patients. The key is to recognize it because, it's, because this requires an emergency cholecystectomy, not a percutaneous cholecystostomy, as they thought it might be a calculus cholecystitis, because you'll increase the risk of complications for the actual patient themselves. We just published a paper in October of AGR regarding gangrenous, uh, non-perforated gangrenous appendicitis, and I'll just show you some examples. We can actually see in this particular example right here, this is a routine 100 kV exam. This is your mononegetic. You can actually see there's some decreased enhancement here along the medial side of the actual appendix. We can see on the iodine overlay maps, there's no pickup. This was proven in the OR that this was gangrenous appendicitis. Again, another example on the routine 100 kV image, you can see there's enhancement all around the appendix, so you think. You go to the mononegetic, there's some decreased enhancement, decreased uptake on the iodine overlay map, another proven gangrenous uh, uh, cholecystitis. Regarding gallstones, you can do the same decomposition algorithm. Still, I mean, don't get me wrong, ultrasound is the test of choice for gallstones. However, sometimes you do these 
uh, uh, CT scans of the abdomen and pelvis, and sometimes you want to know if there are gallstones present or not. You can do a, a, a material decomposition, decomposition algorithm, and you can see it's very difficult to see a stone on a regular CT, but definitely you can color code them and detect them on dual energy CT. The, one of the advantages of dual energy CT is preventing follow-up imaging, particularly of renal lesions is what I would say. This is a hyperdense lesion right here posteriorly of the left kidney. We can see on the dual energy iodine overlay maps, there is no iodine uptake at all. This is a cyst. There's no need to do an ultrasound to prove whether that is a proteinaceous cyst, hemorrhagic cyst, uh, or a, a high density renal cell carcinoma. This particular example, another high density lesion on the right, this is the virtual non-contrast. The iodine overlay map does pick up iodine. We can see there's orange in this particular thing, proven to be a renal cell carcinoma. From a renal stone analysis, what I would say, it's a very simple application. The way it works in the ED, it's not because I want to characterize stones. I use it as a problem solving tool. If it's blue, it's calcium. If it's red, it's uric acid. There's nothing more simpler than that. It's so simple, it's just a click of a button. The reason why I show this case here, this patient had lithotripsy, comes back to the ED with significant pain. So we can see on this particular example that there is some high density material in the renal collecting system. So people will say, is that hemorrhage? Is that iodine? Is it a bleed that's causing this person the actual thing? We see also the stone is still there. It hasn't been broken by the lithotripsy. So let's put on the color-coded maps. We can see on the virtual subtraction that it is iodine. I subtracted the iodine. It's not hemorrhage. We can go to the stone analysis application. And we can see the reason why it was unsuccessful on lithotripsy, it's a uric acid, it's actually red. It's a uric acid stone. It follows below the identity line. So this is a uric acid stone that might not respond as appropriate to ESWL as do with some other stones. And actually uric acid stones, you can do medical dissolution therapy instead of going to the lithotripsy. I'll finish off with the musculoskeletal. I know my time's coming to the end. What I would say about gout, Initially, when people you know, were laughing while we were doing this for gout, this was a case that came into the ED, a, pa a patient with acute myelogenous leukemia. And we have very experienced musculoskeletal radiologists at VGH, and they thought, uh, they thought this was osteomyelitis in an immunosuppressed patient. Nobody wanted to stick a needle into this patient because the patient was immunosuppressed. So we clicked on the dual energy application. Green equals gout. That's, I'm just going to it's very simple. So green is G for gout. This was an actual tophus. Patient was treated conservatively. There was no reason to do an aspiration. And the reason for that is we know that leukemia patients have very high cell turnover. They have a significant amount of uric acid in their bloodstream. This case recently came in. I mean, this is a, an unbelievable case with unrelenting back pain, query metastases. And I would just challenge anybody uh, on the routine CT examination that you can tell me what the diagnosis is that's causing this patient's back pain. You can see these destructive lesions involving the posterior elements. You'll see some of them extending into the spinal canal with significant pain, uh, uh, irritating the nerve roots. A simple application is click on the, so we do all of our lumbar spines uh, with dual energy. We just click on the, uh, the gout application and we see this is gout. This is not a metastasis. This is not a simple lesion. This is a very simple, a very simple application, a very simple answer that gives you the answer why this patient has unrelenting pain. This particular one, for, just for the musculoskeletal radiologist, I mean, this was actually uh, um, uh, taken to sarcoma conference. And I just took these x-rays because the x-rays from, were from outside. And they wanted to biopsy these lesions. And I'll go to the CT scan. So you see these expansile lesions that are involving the medial malleolus, right? So they wanted to biopsy. This is went to sarcoma conference. I mean, and we've got experienced MSK radiologists at VGH that do a lot of sarcoma conference. They did an MRI. It was non-revealing to them. As you can see some peripheral enhancement on GAD, did a bone scan, completely positive as well. Put on the dual energy application, this is intraosseous gout. It's very rare, but it does exist. There was no reason to biopsy this patient. This is a benign lesion. There was no reason to biopsy this at all. Regarding bone marrow edema, one thing I would say, you can detect, I'm just gonna move forward for time's sake, just for uh, 
query for the fractures. You can see in this application was query fraction on the x-ray. We did a CT. This was subtle. Again, it's increasing. When I see this green stuff, it's bone marrow edema. I can see on the, on the black and white images, the high signal, uh, the high attenuation, sorry, indicates bone marrow edema. It gives me that increased confidence that I'm dealing with a, uh, an acute fracture. The other thing you could do with dual energy, and there's some research on this that we're doing, is you can click on this, what they call this collagen application class, and you can actually look at collagen, whether it's uniform or not, and we can actually see with the correlated with the MR is that there's a tear of the PCL in this particular example. We can see kissing contusions, as you would do on MR, on this dislocation, relocation for the actual patella. What we can see as well, it works very well for the hip. This was a query fracture right here. It's definitely high attenuation, indicating edema, nicely illustrated on the color-coded maps. Another example, query fracture, yes, maybe. Bone marrow edema present, color-coded, definitely a fracture present. This particular example, we can see we would get some MRIs for correlation. You can't see anything on the CT. This is a high-resolution CT done at 0.6 millimeter collimation. I would challenge anybody to find a fracture here. There's extensive bone marrow edema, nicely illustrated on the MR with an insufficiency fracture as well, is what I would say. The last case I would say, food for thought, and we can finish with this case, is this was the, the case that was a medical legal implication case that a, a, a CT scan done, was read as negative. I don't see a fracture on that CT, a lot of osteo. But if we do the, when I went back in this case and I was asked to look at this case, if we look at the bone marrow edema application, we can actually see there is high attenuation that is actually present. Color-coded maps definitely illustrates the presence of edema. One thing I would say, I've been illustrating a lot of color-coded maps. You can actually quantify this as well nicely on, on dual CT, and, and you can do a region of interest here and a region of interest over the area you suspect this bone marrow edema, and the attenuation would be significantly higher than in the regular bone marrow that is present in the rest of the tibia or the femur itself. Patient returns back and has a significant fracture right here and need an external stabilization device and damage their vascular uh, anatomy as well, is what I would say. So I think given the time, I think, uh, I think we've gone through an extensive system. Hopefully I've illustrated to you how, what the clinical advantages of dual NGCT is. I think it's here to stay. I think it is the new frontier of imaging and I think we can see a whole new world through these different colors. Thank you for your attention.